It is a great honor to welcome Ben Appel on this program. He is a writer based in New York. He has a forthcoming memoir uh, titled Cis White Gay, which is coming out next year in 2024, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right now, we are going to discuss his uh, wonderful, fascinating article on Spike. It is titled Homophobia in Drag. How are you today, Ben? Thank you for joining the show. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, we are recording this on the um, 25th of June, and obviously at the tail end of what uh, many call Pride Month, and I call it mm. June. So uh, I wonder if uh, uh, if uh, if there is any meaning to Pride Month, what what does it mean to you? Yeah, it's funny because you know I, I, it is ironic we're having this conversation where you know the parade the new york i'm in new york and the pride parade is today so i was watching some of the coverage on uh abc earlier um and just kind of you know gasping in exasperation at the the narrative that they that they you know just seeing it condensed and distilled um the way that they they do it was really kind of educational for me because i don't really you know tune into ABC's takes on LGBTQ plus issues very often. So, um, you know, just they're they're talking about, you know, all of the the anti LGBTQ plus bills that have been um, uh, presented in, you know, legislatures across the country. And, um, and it's just funny, because most of those bills have to do with medicine and with what's called gender affirming care um specifically for minors and um it's ironic that they're calling them anti lgbtq plus bills when they actually indirectly protect a lot of lesbian and gay and bisexual people from medical malpractice and i would argue even trans identified or trans people from uh from really really poor shoddy uh healthcare practices um and you know unscientific um practices that are not evidence based and so you know those things really kind of amuse me another one was i saw there was a i don't know if she was a, a pop star or something she was a trans woman a black kim trans petrus, woman right? is it kim petrus was that Kim Petras, that's what who are you talking about? No, right? no, no, no. So she was a black black trans woman. Oh, okay. and she was giving an interview, and she had said, uh, you know, there's there's really no difference. But she said something like, I'm paraphrasing, but there's really no difference between drag queens and and trans people. Um, all drag queens are trans mm. because trans is an umbrella term, and it includes drag queens under that umbrella. And I thought, oh gosh, I could list. A mil so many trans people I know that would be so dissatisfied with that and that definition and and to say that their um, history of gender dysphoria um, and and as adults their decisions to medically transition um, you know is compared to to dressing up in drag and parading around in a kind of like very a caricature of the opposite sex um, interesting stuff and of course, I would also like to mention that the new pride flag looks very ugly, and I prefer the older one, the one with just the rainbow, and then the new one, they add all of the things and makes it look ghastly, to be honest with you. Yeah, there's a lot of us that feel that way. Um, again, you know, there are people like to say that there's no uh overlaps between the LGB and T communities that were totally separate. You know, a lot of people that are pretty angered and flustered by uh, the, the direction that the gay rights movement has taken after we pretty much won all these initiatives that we had set out to achieve um, for civil rights. And, the, but there is a big overlap. There, there is a big overlap with these communities because the, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of transgender or transsexual trans identify people are same sex attracted and they are homosexual people and they're very gender non-conforming and um they uh, uh, a lot of them have 
uh, made the decision as adults to transition to to blend in with society and an attempt to pass as the opposite sex to combat their gender dysphoria. So there are a lot of avenues and pathways to trans identification and coming to the decision to to transition and it's really multiplied uh i don't know how many folds tenfold um some of the motivation is sexual it's uh something called autogynophilia um which is that you know being aroused by the thought of yourself as a woman so a lot of 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 males who are are trans identified are in fact attracted to women, um, but they also are primarily concerned with or turned on by or aroused um, by the thought of themselves as women. There are, you know, like, again, homosexual, transsexual people. And then there are people who we have young adolescent and teen girls who are uh, suddenly identifying as transgender and and deciding to pursue not just social transition, but medical transition for all different types of reasons. Um, young men as well who don't want to grow up to be, you know, cis toxic males because to them um, they've kind of internalized the message that maleness and masculinity is inherently toxic. And so they kind of seek uh, and because these are sensitive kids they are sensitive boys, young men, um, not gay necessarily. They're straight. They just don't want to be um, a villain. And so they identify as as trans so there's a there's a lot of of different there's a lot of moving parts and in a way it is a big tr umbrella term today um it's 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 really really expanded um but you know up until not too long ago the understanding was is that it was just people adults with gender dysphoria that had um chosen to to transition in adulthood um and now it's become something totally different <laughs> so the spike article is named um, homophobia in drag as i've mentioned so how would you compare uh, this type of homophobia with the kind that uh, unfortunately you grew up with yeah well you know it's really different it's really different it's really it's very insidious um it's very you know it's the homophobia i grew up with uh you know, a lot of it was religious based, but most of it was just the, my peers, older people, um, but especially my peers and the bullying that I, you know, endured in middle school and high school. It was unacceptable for me to be gender nonconforming in the way that I was. I was a really effeminate kid, just naturally. Um, I, and I was, I was tormented for it. And so my coping mechanism, my survival tech tactic was to just really defeminize myself. I became like a chameleon. I really just, you know, was constantly self-scanning for signs of, of any kind of femininity and trying to stamp it out because it was terrifying. And I had grown up in a very, very religious um, setting. And so I knew what being gay meant. I knew what being, you know, a fag meant um for my soul and 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 you know and what it meant about me as a person so it was a lot about gender nonconformity there just was not room for that it was just unacceptable and i found my way uh, a lot of people found their way i do write in that article about how like once i came out and in my early 20s i kind of experimented with reconnecting with a lot of that those feminine things you know painting my nails and experimenting with makeup and stuff but it eventually felt like it was like just a, kind of a futile exercise it didn't really mean anything it was like okay this isn't who i am my ideas how i treat people my relationships my beliefs everything my intellect that's who i am as a person and all of this is just yeah i can choose to you know uh costume or or do whatever but that's just expression that's just it's just uh and and I can I can do what I want it wasn't as fulfilling as it as it was as I you know got older and I wanted to become a LGBT activist or a gay activist and you know got involved in marriage equality in Maryland and you know studied uh some gender and sexuality and human rights at Columbia I really wanted to and again I say this in that article I think I do in that piece that you know I wanted to help 
create a, a world, a society, or at least, you know, it move towards a society where there was a space for gender nonconforming people, that we were natural variations of our own sex. We're a minority, yes, but a valid minority. And it's okay, you know, for, for some boys to be more effeminate and some girls to be more butch. And that, you know, with kids especially, we can just get them, you know, in, in if it's boys, if they're more inclined towards drawing and art and fashion and, and mute or whatever, um, I was into everything, essentially. I mean, I was into athletics as well, but there's just, you know, but what I find is, is that there's this new movement to medicalize these kids who very well would likely grow up to be gay or lesbian like me and to trans attempt to transition them to the opposite sex, which we know is an impossibility because you can't change your sex, but they're kind of being fed this idea that, oh, if you feel uncomfortable or if you if you identify this this towards the Barbie on the gender spectrum scale, as opposed to the GI Joe, and you're, you're a male identified male at birth, then you might actually be a girl, which is just monumentally regressive. And everyone knows this and everybody, people do say it. Other people are afraid to say it. Um, and so that is the new homophobia because a lot of these medical procedures, drugs, et cetera, they have a long history of being derived by uh, clinicians, drug companies, whose initial and primary goals, or one of their primary goals, was to cure homosexuality. So when they derive these synthetic hormones, testosterone and estrogen kind of uh, uh, isolated them and said, oh, this is kind of the fundamental essence of femaleness. This is the fundamental essence of maleness. Well, what can we do? We can make men more virile and we can make them, but we can also make them not, you know, like maybe this will cure homosexuality. Um, and then of course, you know, estrogen uh, being supplied to um, homosexuals that were convicted of homosexual offenses were chemically castrated with estrogen, which are the same, you know, sex hormones that are being given to young trans identified males and also adult males. Um, because the thing is, is with children, but it's a lot of adults who have transitioned that have said this was a huge mistake. This was not for me. I, I was constantly chasing this. Oh, the next surgery, the next drug, the next step will get me there, will get me to this place where I'll finally be the opposite sex. And it never comes. And they're just completely exhausted. And um, there's a lot of irrevocable damage that's been done. And thankfully, they can go on to live, li you know, fulfilling lives. But there's a lot of damage, a lot of trauma, and a lot of hurt. So this is just a kind of new iteration of that. It's not really necessarily. It's so far kind of removed from religion in a way, because, like I said, we're kind of familiar with coming up in the '80s and the '90s. There was Jerry Falwell and Pat Robinson and all of these, you know, the the moral majority and the Christian right, and and all of them talking about, you know, AIDS was God's punishment for gay, you know, all of these these really religiously motivated things. And there are obviously that's running through a lot of homophobia that still exists. Of course, it is. It's still there, which is why it's unfortunate that this movement has become this way because gays and lesbians, especially, are in the middle, really trying to fight two really opposite extremes and then being vilified on it on both ends one side's calling us groomers and pedophiles and the other side is is calling us traitors fascists grifters uh queeslings right wing you know bootlickers all that kind of thing um but but where this does overlap with religion in terms of the new kind of queer theory perspective and the medicalization and the the medicalization being sold as liberation is that it does resemble practices in Iran, where they are a theocratic nation. They're under the theocratic, uh, you know, elite there, the the regime. They do, homosexuality is illegal, and they do coerce uh, gays and lesbians, or gays and lesbians are co coerced to transition, um, to become normal straight people. So they see kind of all people who have those effeminate tendencies or masculine tendencies of their women. And then same sex attraction is just having a medical disorder and it can be cured with surgery and hormones. Um, and so they can blend into society. We can keep this really tidy two sex, um, you know, and two gender uh, uh, society going. And so, and that is in a lot of ways, religiously motivated. 
because of in Christianity and, and Islam, they really derive a lot of their anti-homosexuality beliefs or their beliefs that it is wrong from the same stories in 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 scripture, um, which is the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, uh, I think Luti is the name is the term for um, for homosexuals or men who are penetrated by other men or 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 maybe who penetrate men. I can't remember which. And so um, there's overlaps there. So it's just a really weird confluence of all of these complex. And so like, again, going back to the pride coverage and just seeing it distilled in these simplistic love is love. And how could anybody debate? They kept saying human rights. It's humanity. How could anybody debate human rights? I can't believe we're legislating human rights. It's human rights, human rights. And I'm thinking it is so much more complex than this. And good God, you have to be stupid to just you know, take all of this in um, and to say, oh, um, you know, I, you know, and so much of this, this was the the cutaways they had to the stories of different people who had overcome, you know, while some of them were, you know, uh, inspiring in their own right, they're all scored to tinkling piano. And it's very, it's just very, you know, it's, it's very, uh, propagandistic and and unfortunately there are some truths underneath there but in reality it's much more complex than that and a lot of people are really being hurt so yes um i think i share your observation in that as um uh, gays and lesbians become more openly about their sexuality at least in the u.s and the west um we see that um the um, I guess the cultural norms or social norms that we associate with being masculine or feminine have been, you know, have been blurred or have been diversified. As in, there are many more ways to be men, and there are many more ways to be women. You can you can like things that are traditionally known as girly as a man, and vice versa if you are a woman. But um, this whole intense focus on uh, being transgender identity and such where if you if you are a man and you wish to transition to a woman you the result is that you end up looking and behaving like a very stereotypical woman and I believe the same would be for a woman to transition to a man so that in turn reinforces these stereotypes or traditional views held by society about males and females right yeah it's true Mm -hmm. you know there there are i would say that the yeah it's true i mean there are uh variations within that but it it does it reifies these gender norms and and stereotypes for sure that they're they're there for a reason i mean a lot of what we call gender which is just such a ridiculous concept really but you know this societal construct of gender gender roles gender expression etc a lot of it is derivative of sex, of biological sex. You know, there are fundamental sex differences that encourage different ways of expression and being among the sexes. And then within those sexes, there's overlap and there's, it's a bell curve, you know, and there's variation. And again, there are minorities of people that are very, very presenting or expressive as the opposite sex naturally it's just always been that way since they were really really young um and so you know am i of the ilk that's like smash all gender norms and gender you know and everybody it's like well some of it is i mean it's you know not to the point where i want to vilify a, a woman you know for being traditionally a feminine and wanting to present that way or a man to be very you know masculine and, and whatever we call masculine and whatever we call feminine, that's that's also uh, counterproductive. It's counterintuitive. It's not again not scientific, because a lot of these differences are um, not. It's all, not all society. We're not blank slates. This is biological, and there are reasons why we have these sex differences and gender differences and gender presentation. Um, so. <laughs> So um, you wrote in the essay that uh, you enrolled in Columbia at the age of 33 in 2017, and uh, you discovered that aside from hearing the word cis or cisgender being described to you for the first time, I presume, 
you also hear that the word queer has now taken a new, perhaps more positive meaning. So um, why don't you uh, relate to us um, how the word queer meant to you, you know, growing up and how queer meant to, I guess, Columbia, LGBTQ yeah. people. Well, I'll tell you, like, so I really didn't have a long history with queer. Queer, I mean, there are so many older, you know, folk or different generations of gays and lesbians who were called queer in a derogatory way as a slur. I was mostly called faggot. So I I, I didn't have queer as much. That wasn't really, um, that wasn't really a thing for me. But what I saw was, I saw that with this identifier of queer, it wasn't just that they were kind of repurposing what, what a word that was for a lot of people very offensive, um, but that it was opening the door for so many people to just opt into a queer identity and inclusion in that, you know, population or demographic or community of people. One example is I remember I was in, I studied writing uh, at, at Columbia and I was in a writing workshop my senior year there, my last year there. And a young woman had written a essay, personal essay about a falling out that she had had with a roommate. And uh, her, fa her roommate's father was very conservative maybe, or she was afraid of how, you know, uh, he would perceive her when he came to visit. And she said something, you know, like as a queer woman, because I'm queer, I wasn't sure. And, you know, here is this young woman who is, I mean, straight, long-term boyfriend, you know, the most, you know, uh, she was as gender non-conforming as, you know, Candace Cameron, you're, or like, you know, as, as uh, a, a Victoria's Secret model. I mean, she was just, you know, and I thought, well, what, what do you mean queer? And I did pose this question to the class. I said, you know, I'm kind of confused. You identify as queer. I'm not really sure. You know, this was back in 2019, I believe, or maybe early 2020, you know, like, and of course I had been enmeshed in this for a while, but it was just these kind of moments that I thought, well, what does queer even mean? Everybody, essentially everybody's queer. I mean, I don't know if she had taken like some kind of gender studies class and, and you know, really rethought, oh, gender is a construct and had read some Judith Butler or whatever and said, oh, that's me. You know, I am included in that because I can conceptualize what, you know, the possibility that I could be, you know, attracted to women or that some of my expression is um, societally constructed. I, I mean, it's just such a, it's, it's not, it doesn't create knowledge. It's just a, it's just a questioning, a, a, a skepticism or even a nihilism. And so it, it's also insulting because while I don't want to just stew in the difficulties I had being, you know, an oppressed gay growing up in, you know, and, and being discriminated against and bullied and all of that stuff, but it is a little bit hard to deal with when you have young people who are saying that they're queer and then kind of coming into the community and policing our norms and behaviors and the way we see things and saying you cis gays are evil and you cis gays are this and that and and when they have no idea that they're that they're actually straight and that they have no idea what it's really like to have grown up in the time that we did um and and ba and battled the things that we did um it's 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 really it's it's angering to be perfectly honest and of course, also in the halls of Columbia University, you encountered the political thoughts of one Michel Foucault, Frenchman, and um, I think his ideas have been very much appropriated by, I guess, uh, the queer activists, so to speak, or people who call themselves such. So I, I suppose in your reading of Foucault, um, how does how how does his ideas translate into uh, the current climate that we ha are having? Well, you know, like a big thing for that, you know, is that Foucault uh, writes or had wrote that, you know, homosexuality wasn't, he says something like, you know, it was uh, something that people did and then it became like a species of human once it was kind of named and classified 
in medical literature in the late 19th century, so like 1876 or nine, whenever, is that that was when, because there was suddenly this label given to homosexual or homophile or whatever they call them, but homosexual people, that prior to that, there wasn't a homosexual per se. There were just people were, a lot of people were naturally bisexually inclined and um and there were you know people that did or or had homosexual sex but there wasn't like a subcategory or subculture of homosexuals and you know in some ways there's validity to that because but it's has a and you know he he kind of frames it in this kind of like marxist uh you know, a capitalist, like it was almost like a, a way to organize society for the state, you know, into this kind of for production per se, which doesn't really make a lot of sense because homosexuals don't procreate. Anyway, you know, but a lot of it did have to do with there is some legitimacy to these kind of homosexuals developing as like an identity or a demographic or a population of people with industrialization you know with urbanization it gave a lot of people liberalism the opportunity to lead lives that were in line with who they felt they naturally were a lot of these people flocked together in urban areas and there did a subculture did develop that was homosexual or gay and lesbian um, but especially gay, because men were um, afforded a lot more rights and more uh, freedoms to to uh, act out in this way, or at least in privacy. Um, of course, they were criminalized for it. But so, you know, there is some validity to that. But to suggest that there aren't exclusively same sex attracted people throughout history, we know that there have been and that there are um, all throughout history. So the the reality with Foucault is that he wasn't really a historian he was a thinker and he was a philosopher but he didn't he, he was a modern historian and his his understanding of modern history was was faulty and it was it had a lot of holes and so um with that being said why that's important is that with so many queer theorists now talking about how knowledge is created through language and our reality is created through language and uh, everything that we're blank slates, everything is, is, is socially constructed. Um, you know, there's really no sex is a spectrum Bio, biology, is, you know, uh, gender is a spectrum and everything is it's, it's uh, eliminating or erasing the, the very concept of homosexuality. If you look on um, rights organizations websites they they define homosexuality now as attracted to the same gender you know same gender attracted in very vague weird terms around that which is not the and they just substitute gender for sex and that's what creates so much confusion because it's not the same thing what they're doing is they're saying that women who are attracted to the same gender they're essentially saying that males can be lesbians and that for a lesbian to refuse or to not be attracted to a person who has male genitalia um that that person is transphobic it just opens the store and it really does essentially uh kind of negate or erase the concept of homosexuality and it is the queering with queer theory it's the queering of everything that we understand um, to be our reality and what we've because it's evidently all a product of uh, bourgeois capitalist white cis um, domination and um, and you know to create it in order to oppress and keep people down yes and I think from my reading of Foucault he does uh have this um, odd obsession with the fact that every sort of norm that he perceives or is accepted uh, represents a form of power domination in some sense of the word. Um, uh, of course, like you said, there is there is some like legitimacy to certain ideas that you know certain norms which are 
have been accepted for you know, for a long time may be the result of power domination. Say, for example, for the longest time, um, the American Psycho Psychological Association, right, uh, characterized homosexuality as a mental disorder or mental illness. Right. But of course, that doesn't mean that all norms should be um, broken down or everybody should be liberated because um, I think uh, what Foucault failed to understand, deliberately so, I think, is that um, if we are, uh, if there is a certain kind of liberation from these norms, then new norms are going to um, foster and they might be more repressive. And that's why this transgender, um, I guess, moment of liberation quickly becomes a stifling orthodoxy. And people like you are, I guess, uh, excluded from uh, their circles. Yeah, well, look, it's like, you know, that's a good, really good point. And, um, you know, I, I kind of tweeted facetiously recently about like, you know, what fucking genius thought that creating new categories of, of genders or, or whatever was actually going to expand what was possible for men and women rather than just be breeding more conformity. I mean, you can spot a non-binary person or a non-binary identified person in the city from a mile away because they all most so many of them wear the same fucking uniform and they have the same haircut the same you know and it's like this isn't this is it's it's a farce it's ridiculous it's actually sad and it's embarrassing because it's so it's so anti intellectual i guess it's just unserious um but you're right a lot of with foucault it is a rebellion against the normative um, and against whatever's normative, normativity is oppressive. Normativity is derived from the bad people. We must overturn that or raise that to for the for the good, the truly good people, the noble people, the moral, the pure people to rise. It's a really disturbed perspective, um, and it it's really damaging. Mm -hmm. um to society and to a lot of people individually it doesn't create happiness it creates isolation anxiety depression despair um poor decision making and distrust um detracts from any kind of possibility of unity uh, a positive future and building it's really about tearing down rather than building Yes, and I think you might not be surprised to know that Michel Foucault uh, supported the um, Iranian Revolution back in 1979, which uh, brings me to uh, uh, something about Iran that you mentioned earlier, in that um, Iran, with their theocratic anti-gay laws, is actually one of the more liberal regimes when it comes to uh, transitioning people, which is genuinely surprised me when I read your um read your essay. So um, uh, how, how did you come to know of this uh, factoid? Yeah. So, and I want to say too, you know, it is one of the more liberal, uh, you know, toward that, but it, it is also important to know that, you know, trans people there don't just have these fabulous lives and they're not like celebrated by their, I mean, you know, they're still discriminating. A lot of them have to, or do enter into prostitution and they actually have, you know, divorce there where, um, but outside of marriage, sex is illegal. So a lot of trans prostitutes will actually like marry for a matter of hours uh, men who want to have sex with them. And then um, and then that, it's, it's just a very, and a lot of them don't want to have their genitals, you know, to be castrated. They don't want to go through this. And again, like they are coerced into this and they have so much, internalized homophobia and so much shame and there are so many lesbians and gays who have fled iran because of these practices and because of the shame that they carried and then thankfully they said i need to get out of here i don't want to go down that road there are people that told me that medical transition is 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 not the the solution and not the answer for this um I learned about this in, ironically, I really did start learning about this, kind of studying a lot of really queer theory heavy, um, taking queer theory heavy courses at, at uh, Columbia. Um, I did study the Muslim world a lot, like gender and sexuality in the Muslim world. And 
it was just kind of this roundabout way where, you know, I learned about these different practices and what was going on and, and, um, Khomeini and the, the fatwa that, that he, uh, issued in, I think 86, it was after meeting, a a gay woman, but a gay man, but a, a trans woman who had started transition. And, um, she had convinced him to, um, help people like her and, it was posed by us. Uh, actually, I, I haven't thought about this for a while, but one specific professor did kind of say that it wasn't so much just, you know, religiously motivated, but some of it too was the Arab world. They were almost developing these advancements in technology and, and medicine, which really are just really gruesome malpractice but they were developing these and it was almost like kind of a a, a a competition with the west kind of thing um and and to kind of make its place and state its claim in 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 that in that field i do recall him kind of posing it that way but it was it was you know the at columbia so many of these classes it was all about queering and it was all taught through Essentially, I'll tell you, and I know you're probably very familiar with this too, because this is a philosophy, you know, but Edward Said and Oriental, Orientalism. And I was introduced to that my first semester there in a class um, with a really prominent philosopher um, in a course called uh, Contemporary Islamic Civilization. And we read Said and we read Joseph Massad and all these things. And I really came to see, it's not just so much queer theory, queer theory, the sister kind of theory or critical theory to that post-colonialism and queer theory they really um go together uh and uh, those complexities that i was talking about earlier um how everything is just it's a confluence of all of these things it is a lot because of that because of the way that these things are taught so anyway everything was really taught through this kind of orient orientalist lens um where you know uh, every every perception of of the world the, the the east the orient um or anything outside of the west uh was was like though everything that is the west is basically the opposite of 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 all of the derogatory way it's like we we had to we had to define and and label everything outside of us to to develop an identity so the west ide western identity is is just completely a what we are not what we are not those backwards we are not those barbarian we are not those you know like it's and it, this idea that the west is just this this mirror image of 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 backwards regressiveness and where all, you know and so what that does is there again there is a value to looking it kind of interrogating epistemologies obviously you know seeing how they develop knowledge developed and like who was deriving these ideas and thoughts right i mean there is a, a value to that but when it comes the sole lens through which these topics because a lot of these professors are very indoctrinated and they are indoctrinating and of course the TAs and the young people and it's very seductive and and it becomes this oh the big bad west and US and and we're just completely evil and those guys are the good ones all along oh my god and what that means is oh and everything they're doing and how they behave and all of their policies that's the good stuff too you know i remember when um uh it was Brunei, I think it was Brunei, they announced that this was in 20, maybe 18 or 19. And I think this was eventually overturned, but they were announcing that they were going to reintroduce Sharia law. They were going to, and there was this big outcry with a lot of human rights activists in the West, because what that meant was the criminalization of homosexuality, but also the execution of men who had been convicted of especially being penetrated because that's that's the really bad thing is is being penetrated anally the the bottom in the relationship is is the is the real center so um uh there was this a campaign in the west to kind of oh we have to shut this down um because gays are going to start being uh executed and this was almost like the last hurrah 
in the West for like kind of sticking up for gays and lesbians abroad. Like it was like the last like time where I felt, you know, almost like, oh yeah, there is a concern in the West that there are practices, you know, FGM, for example, female genital mutilation with women. Like there are practices that were like, ah, that's probably, yeah, cultural relativism, you know, maybe it's a practice, but that's, that's really barbaric and really brutal and archaic and you know it should probably stop but with this too there was a lot of outcry like you know uh i don't know let's protest this let's draw attention to it um but i remember in my one of these classes this was a different class um the ta who uh what was it was previously at harvard and um she studied i don't even know um i think islam or, or maybe sexuality i can't remember um she said, you know, well, you know, th the way that the West paints this is just totally an Orientalist lens, because it's not like, oh, immediately gays are just going to be thrown off buildings. Like in Sharia law, there is a process for convicting somebody of of this crime. You know, they have to have a certain amount of witnesses to the act. They have to be convicted of sodomy, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just the easiest thing. And it's just so interesting because like with all of these these ex almost like excuses or these ways that they would frame these dialogues around this it was like okay but yeah okay maybe but like at the very bottom of this the reality is is that they're writing into their penal code that a man who has sex with another man should be put to death like i get what you're saying we're we're really looking at the nuance and the complexity of this but i think it's important not to just make all of our idea, all of the work that we're doing, I mean, the academic work, the hours and hours of reading, just interrogating Western perceptions and ideas and philosophy and so on, just to tear it down. It's like, okay, but there's, there's, there's reason why people think and feel this way. And this is an actual human rights issue. Um, and so for me, what I write about and what I am writing about it is that with post-colonialism and queer theory and this lens that it really has opened up a space for this new homophobia and this new kind of umbrella, this broadening of queer and transgender where a lot of gays and lesbians, because homosexuality really just doesn't exist. It's no longer, you know, it's just a, you know, like it's a, an invention of the bourgeois, you know, 19th century bourgeois invention that it's, it's like that it really has, made gays and lesbians really vulnerable to a lot of harm um and kind of old school harm where we're back to medicalizing we're back to um and it's now it's being sold as care you know um it's being sold as and it's it's a marvel to watch and people don't know that this is occurring and I actually forget that. Like, it surprised me to hear you say I wasn't aware of like Iran, you know? And I'm like, I, I just, cause I, I forget that a lot of what goes on is not common knowledge. Of course it's not, you know, why would it be? But it's just been such a looming thing for so long um, in my life and mind. And, and I, think I wrote in that piece, but I've written that, you know, when I first started drawing these connections between what occurred in Iran and what, what was kind of, kind of happening in the West, I just would keep it to myself. Cause I'm like, that's crazy. Like that's, we're not, because you know, and then I started seeing like, oh, shoddy. I mean, like there are people who escaped Iran and they're saying these very things and they're covering and writing about these very things and they're forming organizations and it's there in the literature, even, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember uh, one scholar's name, but even in the literature where, you know, it just takes this random case and it just says, yeah, there was a young woman who said I no longer felt guilty for my same sex attraction once I transitioned and I identified as a man just by the by, you know, and it's like, well, that's a little intriguing there. Like, you know, um, what's that about? And, uh, that she, I, this this scholar framed it in a way of oh you know trans identification is really opening up a space for people to live queer people and and gender non to live safely in this society um you know again almost like this creating a liminal space where it's in an indirect way leading to some kind of liberation when 
these surgeries are, are very unsuccessful or have really high unsuccess rates. They have infections. Uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of really, really terrible complications that require multiple surgeries. And perhaps who knows if a lot of these people can even afford to um, to get more surgeries, even though Iran does, the, the authoritarian state, the state does subsidize, partially subsidize um, sex reassignment surgery um, there because of its desire to eradicate homosexuality from society. Yes, and that brings me to another observation of mine in that while the trans activist class, uh, you know, they have this uh, growing animosity towards uh, gays and lesbians, um, like yourself, but they've also managed to co-op some or even many of the arguments that you guys have made uh, as gay and lesbian activists in order to earn these hard-won victories that you've had uh, in mainstream American society. Um, you know, a simple one would be, well, um, just as you can be born gay, a child can be born trans, but I right. also focus on this one in particular in that now that uh, I believe either in your country or the United Kingdom, where there was a bill that was signed into law or proposed that would ban conversion therapy, which uh, of course there's this is uh, there's a traditional definition of conversion therapy in that uh, you know religiously influenced practices of uh, curing homosexuality, so to speak. But um, there's all a new definition that's always that has been snuck in in that. Well, if you uh, if you intervene with a child who is like confused about his or her gender, that's anyway contrary to what you call gender affirming care, then that is conversion therapy as well. So, um, yeah, how would you break down that difference? Well, it's interesting you say that because going back again to that coverage that I was watching on TV earlier, they were saying, but, you know, there have been pro LGBTQ legislation that have been passed and in, in certain states and the, the anti the, the uh, you know, conversion therapy bills where that illegalized that or abolished that those practices were seen as pro, you know, LGBTQ plus. And again, I'm like, you know, that's only part of the story because like you just said, they've included gender identity in these definitions of what conversion therapy is. So if a young person comes in to a therapist and a clinic and says, I'm trans, the essentially the only really legal possibility for any kind of therapy or doctor to do is just affirm it and say, oh, what's your name? What are your pronouns? Okay, well, this is, you know, and if a, and a child, children and adolescents are leading the charge in front of, of doctors and clinicians and therapists, and, and also activists are leading the charge, because the reality is, is that with these gender clinics that have sprung up throughout the country since 2007, which is not a long time, but it, that's exactly what's happened they are staffed with a lot of activists that who have the lived experience of queerness or transgenderism that are really calling the shots in a lot of, of this. And doctors and clinicians who are trained medically, therapeutically, that take into consideration childhood development, adolescent brain development, you know, like all of these things are really afraid and really essentially shut down um, because they don't want to be accused of this and also with legislation that's passing that they can lose their licenses if they say well let's interrogate that why do you think you're trans or this or that and again putting this in with these conversion therapy bills which is you know uh we're about sexual orientation a lot of these young people are gay and lesbian or would i mean this is the this the tricky thing about it gender precedes sexuality you know kids that when you go through puberty and you start to mature sexually you develop you understand that what your attraction is and it's to the same sex okay or to the opposite sex or to both sexes most commonly the same opposite sex and then you know um but gender and gender nonconformity and these these expressions of 
of atypicality, really sex atypicality for young people, boys and girls, it really comes out as, oh, that's a really girly boy or a really effeminate boy. We won't say like, oh, that's a gay boy or that's a gay girl because these kids aren't sexually mature. But when I started to kind of back years, about six years ago, when I started to really, when things started coming really about trans kids, I started to kind of be like, wait a minute, wait a minute thinking to myself, well, what is a trans kid? Like, what is the difference between the trans kid and the kid that I was? You know what I mean? And I re- there just really isn't. So <laughs> the with, with gender preceding this, you don't hear about protect gay kids, protect lesbian kids. You hear protect trans kids. And it's because they're, the, they're in so many cases, they're the same thing. And a lot of it is kids really struggling with feeling really different, and then also once they start to develop or, or mature, they have this same sex attraction, which is shameful. You know, there's religious internalized homophobic, religiously motivated, but there's also, it's not cool to be gay. You know, like the, with young women, it's, girls, yes, it's like, it's like you identify as trans or trans boy, like you're in, like you're praised, you're love bombed, this and that. No young girl says, oh, I'm a lesbian. That's, ex-, you know, that's exciting. They can be bisexual. Now that's cool or queer, but, um, but there's, there is, so again, if we are creating these bills to include gender identity and clinicians are having kids in and clinicians who I know, who, who have talked to me in one-on-one interviews who work at gender clinics, who are still practicing gender affirming care have said there have been there are yes so many instances where i suspect that this is about difficulty with same sex attraction and it is about sexuality and not about gender if they're in a place where they can't say do you think it's because of this because by doing that it just completely negates or cancels out the whole initial reason why conversion therapy was there It is a new form of conversion therapy in a lot of ways for a lot of people. The transgender psychologist, clinical psychologist, Erica Anderson has said and written this very exact thing. Former, I think she was the president of US PATH, which is the um, Association for Transgender Health in the US, um, that this is a new kind of there is some transing of the gay going on because there are what we would call like proto-gay boys and girls who are gender non-conforming and who are being medicalized their puberty is being stunted um you know with boys and again this is another transgender clinician prominent transgender clinician who who uh operated on jazz jennings famously the the famous trans um you know reality star show uh person and i think Jazz had three or four surgeries, I'm not sure, because it was unsuccessful. Um, and uh, Marcy Bowers is, is, the, is the person who, uh, who did her initial operation and also follow-ups as well. Not the second one, but I think the third one. And who knows, maybe the fourth, if she did have a fourth. Um, but Marcy Bowers has said during the Duke Symposium last year, I think it was last year, that you know young boys especially whose puberty is blocked at tanner stage two which is one of the earlier stages of puberty that they've never experienced orgasm and they never will because their testosterone is blocked and then they proceed to cross sex hormones and then they go through surgery you know when they're just a little bit older their testes are removed so they don't have any they're not producing any testosterone they never experience orgasm we are not just sterilizing possible gays and lesbians we're we're also ruining their sexual function puberty blockers are given and were given to adult sex offenders to chemically castrate them they're treated used to treat prostate cancer different forms of cancer so we are chemically castrating kids. We also are stunting their bone development, possibly their brain development, you know, their cognitive uh, development. It is an experiment on young people. A lot of them, again, gays and lesbians, a lot of autistic people are really caught up in this too. I think the Tavistock Clinic in the, in, in the UK, I think it was maybe 
I don't know, there was a statistic about like maybe 46% of the young people that came in there um, had, uh, were on the autism spectrum. I'm not exactly sure, but that, I think that's right. I think that's the figure that I read. So, you know, this is a, this is a, a harm and it's an abuse. Um, and, but what's so interesting is that Marcy Bowers says in that symposium that, you know, now we're talking about this. So what, what can we, what can we do? Um, you know, we are, we, should we let a little bit of puberty back in? I'm paraphrasing here. But she, she says, well, should we let a little bit of puberty back in so that they can experience orgasm and have some testosterone? And, you know, I know they have a lot of dysphoria around their genitals, around those parts, but hey, what is a penis but a big clitoris? It's all the same tissue. So, you know, we can talk about masturbation. And here I am thinking, this is just, you know, it, when you're denying and taking away a young person's just natural sexual development and sexual awakening, and making it a clinical experiment where, oh, we're going to maybe allow a little bit of puberty in and can encourage you to masturbate so that you can experience this. So then when, when we do castrate you, that you know what to look for or like how to possibly achieve what that is, you know, and, and she said in that same symposium, Marcy Bowers, who is transgender, uh, you know, I know how important sexual uh satisfaction is in relationships from working with survivors of female genital mutilation she said okay if you're experienced with working with female genital mutilation survivors is influencing how you are delivering practices elective practices to people young people or any of any age you really might want to rethink what you're doing here. But the reality is, is that they see this as some kind of life-saving thing. And going back to, and I know I'm going on off here, so I apologize, but I, I want to say too, is that because trans, there are a lot of avenues to trans, trans is, is an act. It's not an identity. It's people transition if they have gender dysphoria and gender dysphoria can be, from a lot of different things again some people are really uncomfortable they're they're very effeminate homosexual transsexuals others are autogynophilic you know autoandrophilic females who are really aroused by the thought of being men um, there are different classifications of this but a lot of older trans women who are wealthy trans women who are leading the charge on these practices are not your homosexual transsexuals that a lot of them are who knows what the 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 motivation is for their transgenderism but a lot of them still identify as lesbians or they had wives and they can say whether you know and they had they've had kids of their own etc so they're pushing for this and they all transitioned as in, in adulthood they were able to birth children and so then they're pushing for these practices for kids it's when there's there's so much difference between so many of these young gay kids and and Rachel Levine, you know, it's a completely different, completely different. We're not the same. And the fact that organizations now are taking the dictates of these adult trans women and having their word influence and affect their policies regarding care of gender nonconforming kids it's a dark thing. It's a dark place that we've reached. Um, the The profitability of it is enormous. I mean, I think in 2022, it was about maybe 500 million US dollars globally for gender reassignment surgery that's projected to double by 2027. So, you know, we're, th there's a big battle because who's going to want to say no to that as well in, in this, you know, uh, for-profit healthcare, you know, North America, of course, leads the charge in that. Um, and a lot of it has to do with our, with our healthcare system and the way that it operates. I think this is a well and good note to end on. Thank you very much, Ben Appel from New York for joining this uh, transgressive, provocative, but honest and interesting conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I can't wait to have you on once again once uh, the book comes out. I very much look forward to it.
Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Take care. Um, and happy too. Pride Month. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thanks.